Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, and Ahmaduhu, when a stain, who, when a stock fit, who, when a minu behe, when a tobacco, alay. When all the billa him in Shururi and Fusina, women say at Malina, Maya, the Hilla, who fell a modilla, but my yudlil, who fell a hadiella. When a shadow and la ilaha in the law, who wah the hula, shari kala. When a shadow and the sea dinner was an edina, was she fee and a Mohammedan Abdu, who were a Sulu, and أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا آمنوا بالله ورسوله صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي كما صليت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Following up on last talk, where I was talking about the Kalimat al-Shahada, the testimony of faith, La ilaha illallah, I actually wanted to offer some more reflections on this very important first pillar of Iman. And if you remember from last time, I mentioned that often we have many ulama and scholars and speakers have commented a lot on Salah, on Ramadan, on Zakah, and on Hajj. And the first of the five pillars, Iman, is often taken for granted because we all assume that once we recited the Kalima, we have said that the Shahud Shahada, that we are now fulfilled this first pillar. But the reality is that a lot of the problem a lot of us have is due to our weakness in Iman or some lapse in Iman. And then a lot of the crises and major fitness of today are due to people's doubts in their iman and questions in their iman. So if you think of it this way, and I've actually, you know, prepared a few different ways of looking at this. And so I will go a little bit slow, inshallah, and there will be a lot of material. But I want all of you and all of us, inshallah, to keep thinking, especially in our recitation of Qur'an al-Kareem, studying the seerah, learning hadith, our daily life experiences, our personal reflections, try to keep Iman at the center of it. Because Iman is the most valuable thing that we have in this world and the next life. And f- and Iman will be the most valuable thing we will have in the Qabr and the grave. And Iman will be the single most valuable thing we can have on the Day of Judgment. And it has to be something that we have to think about more and more in our heart and in our life. So if you look in Qur'an al-Kareem, the first thing which suggests this sort of stages of Iman and this progression of Iman is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are three phrases that come, three words or phrases. Uh, the first is a phrase, Allah amanu, and the second is mu'mineen, and the third is muttaqeen. These are the three most frequently mentioned, repeated words and phrases by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Kalamullah, Kitabullah, Quran al Adim about you and me about insan, what we're supposed to be, right? There's that general, nas, insan, bani adam, three ways where humanity has been addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by virtue simply of being humanity in his creation, and then three ways that they have been addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them to understand what their real identity as a human being is, and that is, Allah amanu, those who have professed iman, adopted iman, pledged iman, Mu'mineen, those whose very attribute and heart and soul is now permanently centered and focused on Iman and their lives are being lived on Iman. And third, Muttaqeen, those who are truly aware and conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have awe and reverence for Him, fear Him as He deserves to be feared, love Him as He deserves to be loved. And in some sense, these three, grammatically also, linguistically also, but also in the way that they're described in Qur'an the Kareem, are stages. So the first stage, although it's not always a stage, because at any level, any and all of us are, have all three, we may be weak muttaqeen, average mu'mineen, struggling alladhina amanu. So alladhina amanu, if I were to explain it in English this way, alladhina amanu, I've already explained those who adopt and profess belief, mu'mineen, I've explained muttaqeen. All right. The reason I'm mentioning this first thing is that sometimes some of us think that a lapse or a mistake that we make in our deen 
is due to lack of taqwa. And that may be, well be true, but sometimes it's also due to a weakness in our iman. And the reason I'm stressing this is that because many of us know that taqwa is the highest thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Quran, inna akramakum inda lahi atqaqum, that the most honored of you in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's regard are those who have the most taqwa. We think that if there's a lapse of taqwa, we're missing the highest level thing. Whereas if we were to view this as a lapse or weakness in our iman, we would realize it's a more critical situation and we have, we're missing something in our very core fundamental aspect. So let me give you a simple example to illustrate. When a person misses Fajr Salah, yes, definitely at one level it's a lack of taqwa, lack of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lack of awe and reverence for the might and majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a lack of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it also should be viewed as a weakness of our iman. And I think if a person, Allah and it may work for different of you different ways, but I think if a person realizes it's a weakness of their iman, they will view it more critically as a more critical condition and they will work harder to rectify that condition. In other words, why? how can I not pray Fajr Salah if I really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As opposed to, oh, if I was one of the muttaqeen, I would pray Fajr Salah. Because obviously all of us are going to say we're not of the muttaqeen. So rather what we should say when we're addressing ourselves, and this is muhasaba, this is the real way to make progress in deen, is to critically examine yourself, to rectify yourself, to address yourself and say that what's the problem with my iman? Do I really believe in Allah SWT as he should be believed in? So this is what the way Allah SWT explained in Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu O you who are alladhina amanu, who have adopted and professed iman, aminu. Now truly have iman, deeply have iman, be true to your iman, adopt the actions of iman, adopt the heart and character and feelings of iman, adopt the behavior and interpersonal relations of iman, have the submission that befits your iman. So these basic lapses that we have, whether it's Fajr Salah, whether it's some character flaw, whether it's uncontrollable anger, whatever it is, we should view it. And, and, and it, if we get to that, inshallah, later I will show some ahadith where Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam has mentioned many of these things as part of Iman. Salah is part of Iman. Haya is part of Iman. And if one was to gather all the verses in Quran al Karim about Iman, and Alladina Amanu and Mu'mineen, and then all the ahadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam about Iman and Alladina Amanu and Mu'mineen, we'd realize that Iman isn't just saying the Shahada, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad an abduhu wa rasuluh, but it's much, much more. And again, I repeat that Iman is the most important thing that we have. So Alladina Amanu, then Mu'mineen, then Muttaqeen, then there are obviously never, you know, stages of taqwa, and it, it's a journey. This itself is the teaching of Quran, Sirat al-Mustaqeem, that this deen is a path, it's a journey. So we should not think that it's just a journey of taqwa and akhlaq and zikr, and we're done with the iman part. No, constantly our whole life we will spend nurturing our iman, protecting our iman, before we even get to strengthening, protecting our iman from fitnas, from fitna ideologies, from the fitness of our nafs, from the fitness of shaitan, from the fitness of foul members of this creation, protecting and safeguarding our iman, nurturing and nourishing our iman, then strengthening our iman, being true to iman. And yes, all of that includes, will include and inshallah lead to taqwa. And really I feel that this is... Uh, most of our weaknesses, whether individually or as an ummah, is due to the weakness of iman, the lapses in iman. Okay, so this was the first take I wanted to do using these three expressions in Quran: "Alladina amanu mu'minin and muttaqin," and the verse that we recited: "Ya alladina amanu aminu billahi wa rasulihi." Okay. Second, and I've done this before, but I'm going to do it again slightly differently: is the khutbah. So some of you may have heard me, sometimes I like to discuss this, that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very often made a particular khutbah, whether in Salat al-Jum'ah and Salat al-Eid at the time of Nikah, other occasions, Alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa nu'minu bi. 
So here I was thinking that, look, Iman came later. Why? The first came Nahmaduhu. So I'm going to show it in a different way. If you think of an atheist, right, and they're coming and, they're th they're con and they want to discuss Iman, whether Iman is true, all right? So what we are learning in our deen from the sequence of the words in this khutbah and Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said these sentences many times with the same order. So the order is not, um, you know, accidental. It's very deliberate and has deep meaning. First, you have to do hamd. Now, a person would say, oh, I don't even believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't believe in God. How can you ask me to praise Him? So I would reply that, look, first of all, this is, that would be a separate topic, a separate lecture, but there is no rational basis to be atheist. The most a person can do, a basic ordinary human being who has no knowledge of anything in the world, the lowest they can go is 50-50, a 50-50, 50% a agnostic. What does it mean that the, low, the minimum that a human being can have is that there's a 50% chance that God exists and a 50% chance that God doesn't exist. There's no rational basis to disprove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So somebody who comes to you with a basic 50-50, unless they're, you know, an ideological, militant, atheist, ex-Muslim, some of them are like this, all right? Okay. So first step is you have to have hamd. First step is to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that person would say, why well, I don't even believe in God. So look, even if you think there's a 1% possibility that a being who is all-powerful, all-merciful, all-beautiful, all-wonderful, all-amazing, all-loving, all-kind, all-just exists, you should praise such a being. So hamd is a very important foundation of our iman. And so what? And now look at it a different way. When we miss our salah, we're missing a lot of hamd, because in salah there's a lot of hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The salah itself is an act of hamd, Praise and glorification and magnification and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inside salah, we say the word hamd many times in different stages of salah. Nahmaduhu. And what does that also mean? And you see this in the fitna. One of the deepest fitnas of iman, crisis of iman, doubts of iman, is that that person doubts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean that they doubt the existence. Because I've met some Muslims, they don't, they don't outright doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. But what's happening, they can't express it this way. But when I realized this, it was shocking. The problem is they don't feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of praise anymore. Worthy of love, worthy of worship. They've fallen out of love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of some gross misunderstanding in their life about something that maybe happened to them and they're resentful and angry at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether this happened to me or some foul human being taught them some twisted deviant ideology or philosophy and they got confused by that but what happened it didn't take them all the way that they lost their iman in the sense that they don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists it took them away from hamd they don't love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they don't think Allah is wonderful and worthy of praise. All praise befits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They got removed from that. That's how the attack was. Now there's like some praise. They don't speak like this. But I'm giving voice to their feelings and what's going on in their mind. Basically, they have been moved from the position of all praise befits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. They've been moved from that to some praise befits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some praise befits other things also. Science is also praiseworthy. And these people are also independently, independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, billah. This is independently praiseworthy. This itself is something amazing. So then they start talking science and Islam as if, as if like we're talking about two equal things. Right? And many people who are in the world of Islam and science also, I think, unwittingly, unconsciously, subconsciously make this mistake. The accord, there's all praise is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing can be independently praised except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of science is but a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything wondrous and amazing in science that may be worthy of praise is that praise is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a subtle attack. It comes on the hamd aspect. So look at Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nahmaduhu. Second, نَحْمَدُهُ وَنَسْتَعِينُهُ 
Again, the atheist would say, well, are you asking me to ask him for help? I don't even believe in him yet. I would say again, if there's 1% even possibility, because bare minimum is 50%, if there's even 1% possibility of the being who's all guiding and all knowing and willing to guide you from the, you guide you individually, personally, from their infinite, limitless knowledge and wisdom and mercy, you should seek that as a possible source of help. And again, this is how I've seen the attack made. They don't think so. Some of the people who are who have fallen victim to these fitna attacks on their iman, they don't think they need Allah Subhanahu Taala's help. This is another thing that I've seen. I'm fine. I'm doing fine in my life. Or they get deluded by worldly success. So they have been diverted from when the stainuhu. They don't think they need Allah Subhanahu Taala's help. And then there's some who also think that this is another strange thing, another strange type of modernism or formism that they need Allah subhanahu wa help in understanding deen. That I will understand deen through my own intellect because I'm an educated, intelligent person. I don't need the help. And we're talking about help of scholars that they don't pray. So if you ask this person who says, oh, I don't listen to scholars. I don't read any scholarly works. I read Quran directly and I read directly on my own. I understand it. I say, okay. So if I were to sit down and ask them, in the past one year, have you ever asked any scholar to help you, guide you, inform you, advise you in any aspect of your knowledge? They would probably say no. Second question I would ask them is, have you ever made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you in your knowledge? Believe me, they would even be shocked when they realize it. They don't. They don't make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for knowledge. They don't make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, make sure I understand the right thing from Qur'an, make sure I don't misunderstand what I'm reading on my own from Qur'an. They have been moved from nasta'inu. When nasta'inu hu, they don't seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's the second fitna. Third, when nasta'gfiru hu. This is all before wa nu'minu bi. Third is when nasta'gfiru hu. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. This is also one aspect of valuing our iman. Imagine the incredible, like if, if a human being is, every human being is struggling, no human being except the Anbiya alayhi are perfect. The ordinary human being is going to be a mix of good and evil. A good, sincere human being is always going to want the good to be dominant over the evil, will want the evil to be less than the good. So imagine if, there's a human being who doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does not believe in God. Who do they turn to for forgiveness? Who do they turn to in repentance? If you don't have belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means as far as you're concerned, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, but in in that in such a person's mindset, worldview, in their heart and their mind, there is no being with Al Ghafar, Al Ghafur, Al Rahman, Al Rahim, Al Tawab. So that means they have to live with that guilt. They have to live with that guilt and that shame and that evil their whole life. So such a person has no being to turn to, to seek forgiveness from. So every human being is going to make a mistake. Every human being is going to do something evil in their life. Okay, one may, okay they may apologize to that person. If, not every evil is done to others, by the way. There may be some individual evil that a person does. Who are they going to turn to for that? If they don't have a being that they believe in. Finally then comes when nu'minu bihi when tawakkalu alayh and that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this part, what I wanted to show was how our iman doesn't, cannot come alone. Iman has to have this feeling of hum, the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isti'ana or need 
that we need the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and istighfar that we view ourselves as having flaws and mistakes and errors and sins that we need to fix and re have remorse and repent for and seek Allah's forgiveness for. All of this is part of our Iman. Okay, the next thing about Iman I wanted to talk about, which is also very important, always has been important, but also especially in this day and age, is Iman bil ghayb. So Allah SWT describes the believers bil ghayb, that they believe in an unseen is also a part that is this is another way that Iman is attacked. How? So whether it's materialism, rationalism, empiricism, Muslims are increasingly believing only in things that they can see or understand or ascertain or the experience around them. Or they live in the immediate moment. What is happening to them at that moment or at that day or what's happened to them in their life? That's what they call real. Whereas actually what is capital R, R real and it's one of the sifat of Allah subhanahu al haq He is that being who is absolute reality. True reality. Timeless reality. Eternal reality. And that is something beyond our comprehension. This is bil ghayb. It's beyond our, the totality. The totality of the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding. Even the ultimate reality of this world is beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding. If we truly understood this world, we would literally just eat and just be waiting. Like somebody would wait like 80 years in the departure lounge for their flight. And you ask them, and they said, there's no point, I'm catching the flight, so I'm just waiting here. Or they just pretend somebody's waiting eight minutes, right, to catch their flight. So you ask that person, what are you going to do? They say, I'm not going to make any major plans for these eight minutes. In eight minutes, I'll be getting on the plane. So they, if so, because they understand the reality of that time in that boarding lounge, they realize it's completely insignificant. They even view that eight minutes' time as worthless. And now, because people will have the phone, they will just do worthless surfing on that phone for eight minutes. The whole world, its reality is like that. The whole lifetime, not just me and your individual lifetime of eight years, the entire lifespan of the entire universe, from the very moment Allah SWT created the universe through Qun, whether that was Bing Bang or not, Allah Alam, when Allah SWT created the universe through His command, Qun bi fayakun, it became all the way till the end of time when Allah Ta'ala will wrap up and fold up this entire physical created universe and it will only be the realm of the Akhirah. In all that time, which is trillions and trillions of years, Allah Alam, all of that also compared to the infinite time of Akhirah is worthless. Is nothing. This is what math teaches. One trillion over infinity equals zero. This is not, this is something mean you can say we can not understand it. So what is it then? It's part of our Iman bil ghayb. So Iman means it's something higher than ilm. Let me explain it this way maybe. Iman is to believe something more strongly than even were you to have known it. That's Iman. True Iman. Yaqeen, let me maybe use this word because that also comes very short in, the, in Surah Baqarah, right? Yuqinun, they have Yaqeen. So Yaqeen means that your Iman is such in matters that are ghayb that your commitment in, to those things is even more than your ilm through Burhan. Now I will explain English. That Iman, sorry Yaqeen, Yaqeen certainty means that your faith in things that are unseen or not completely comprehensible to you leads to a certainty in your heart even greater than something you know through an absolute proof. So the most common example that's given, right, is 2 plus 2 equals 4. All right? Your iman in ghayb, your belief and faith in something unseen is stronger than even the knowledge, the ilm, that you get through a irrefutable, guaranteed, 100% perfect proof that's called Burhan in Arabic, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's called Iman. Allahu Akbar. So in other words, our Iman that 
Jannah exists, Jahannam exists, is greater than any other knowledge we have, whether that knowledge is scientific or mathematical or aesthetic or anything. Our belief, our iman in the malaika, angels, in all of the previous messengers, alayhim as-salam ajma'in. And also, in that sense, Sayyidina Rasulullah, he sallallahu alayhi wa was unseen to us, right? I mean, unless you're sahabi, except for that first generation of believers, is unseen to us. The revelation of Qur'an or Karim itself is unseen to us, but the mushaf quran and Kalamullah as we have it is obviously seen. But we believe in all these things. We believe that Angel Jibreel brought the first wahi to Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam Iqra in the cave of Mount Hira, even if none of me and you never saw it. We believe that more truly than anything else in the world. This, this is what Iman is. So Iman is a worldview, a philosophy, whatever you want to call it, is radically different than materialism. And this is another fitna that people have, is they base their life decisions and they base their life outlook on things that are apparent to them, on what they see around them. So they get affected by the people they see around them, by the culture they see around them, by the society they see around them, by the media and this is what, it's all visual, it's all screen, it's trying to make humans focus on what is seen. Look at these celebrities, look at these shows, look at these newscasts, news feeds, look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that. And this is completely opposite, the complete antithesis to that way of life that Allah is teaching us in Quran, Al-Ladina Yu'minuna Bil Ghaib. So, no, no, I want to build my life as if, remember? Allah Akbar. The, the meaning of Ahsan in the hadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi in Bukhari Muslim, the angel Jibreel asked him, What is Ahsan? Ahsan. Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi replied that as if I to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala as if you see him. <laughs> Look at that life. Such an iman and bil ghayb that is yaqeen as if I live my life as if I'm seeing Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, as if I can see Jannah. As if I can see Jahannam, as if I can see the manzar, the the, the stages of Yom al Qiyam, of the Day of Judgment, the way Allah has described it. Living a life like that versus living a life that I see what's on the media, I see what they feed me on the screen, I see what they feed me on the billboard, I see what people wear in the fashion of the society. That's another life. <laughs> That's a different type of vision. <laughs> Even in English language, they talk about the life vision. It's about seeing, right? Vision is your outlook and your mission in life. Outlook also is the word look. It's built into the language. Even they know it. It's about what you see. And as Salma is saying, it's about what you don't see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the articles of belief? Billahi. Unseen. Wa malaikatihi. Angels. Unseen. Wa bi rusulihi. Unseen. Wa bi kutubihi. All of them unseen except for Quran al now. But the revelation of Quran... It's original revelation to Sayyidina Rasulullah he says them for me and you unseen. Well Yawm al Akhari, the last day, unseen. Well Qadri Khairihi wa Sharrihi min Allahi Ta'ala. And that uh, the decree and destiny, both the good in it and the tests in it are from Allah Subhanahu. That's also an unseen matter. That is with all of the articles of Iman. So when you value your Iman, you realize that I cannot base my life and decisions and actions on what I see. And what I know, because my iman is greater than what I see, and iman is greater than ilm, it's greater than what I know. Allahu Akbar is a fundamentally different concept of life. Okay, let's next thing I wanted to show you is humanity. Because that's not one of the articles of faith. So I, I read those and I, I if I want to come back to those, but this is not even insan. What deen teaches, ab teaches us about insan is very different than if you don't have deen, what you think of insan. So number one, we believe that there's a ruh inside of ourself that's unseen. That, that's not knowledge that can be acquired through science. There's no x-ray or MRI or CT scan that can see the ruh, right? This is, all, this is unseen. If somebody asks or oh, ask a Muslim, a believer, how do you know the I say it's my iman. Because in Quran, Allah SWT said, it's part of my Iman Bil Kitab that I believe in everything that's mentioned in Quran al I have a ruh. 
He says, well, you cannot establish that through any scientific diagnostic means. He has unseen. So our very concept of what we are, that we have a ruh inside of us, our concept of humanity is also fundamental, is, is based on the unseen. Okay? Then we go even further and we say that as a human being, I have a past. And science will say, no, you had nine months in your mother's um, belly and then you had from the day you were born. And we say, no. We say, because we believe we have a ruh. And second is that ruh has been around for millions of years, maybe billions of years. Allah alam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala personally, directly, without any sabab, without our parents, without, it's not through our parents. The ruh was not made through the ruh of my father and ruh of my mother. No. Ruh was made directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the person will look at you and we say, yeah, unseen. <laughs> this is who we are. Alladina yu'minun bil ghayb. Unseen. So forget even, they will say, I'm not even going to talk to you about evolution because I wanted to talk to you about Adam. And it, We said, we go way back. We'll go further back than that. You, you can't even understand what we believe. <laughs> you want to talk about who was the first father and who was first mother? We believe we go back even, we have a rule which had no father and no mother. Allahu Akbar. Hmm? Unseen. Okay, look at the future of the human. <laughs> There's the past of the human, the present of the human rule, the future of the human. Future of the human, we believe in Akhirah, we live forever, unseen. Okay, look at the death of the human. We say unseen, it's when the rule leaves the body. They say no, it's when the heartbeat ends, when they're brain dead. We say no, it's unseen, when the rule leaves the body. Okay, what happens after you die? You're in the grave and unseen things happen. They will look and say, no, you're just in the dirt and your body is decomposing. We say, no, no, there are many things going on. Angel is entering the grave, is going to be asking us questions. Either the grave will be a punishment Azabi cover, or maybe it will be Rodha the Mineral, the Jannah, a garden from the garden, all unseen. Every single thing, every stage of humanity is unseen. Okay, throughout our life, our entire life, we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding us, guarding us, protecting us, unseen. So let's go back now. So this is one topic was Iman bil Ghayb. Hmm? And so, and, and one of the reasons I mention this is because one of the reasons our Iman becomes weak is because we have stopped, not stopped, but we become weaker in our belief in the unseen. And again, I repeat, a lot of that is because we are too connected to the seen. It's not possible. If you watch every media and every visual input, you will miss Fajr. Because it, the human being cannot go to such extremes that you're feeding it on the seen, but then you want to feed it on the unseen. No. This is the whole concept. Maybe I should explain this a bit more. This is why in our deen we have this notion of zuhud, of disconnecting, withdrawing from the dunya, abstaining from the dunya, being limited, setting limits and boundaries on how deeply we engage the dunya. Because it's a, we know that the human being cannot engage dunya 100% and engage, you know, matters of deen and akhirah 100%. There's only one way to do that, and that was the Anbiya and Mursaleen, anybody who follows their path of dawah, that their only engagement with the dunya is fiddla lilla, right? But you can't, that's not surfing. That's not, that's not internet and billboards and news and entertainment. That's not, that, that's not lilla fiddla, right? So as an individual Muslim, you cannot imagine that you can spend one, two, three, four, five, six hours a day on mindless surfing and think that's not going to affect your ta'aluk, your connection with the unseen. It will affect. The more we are over-connected, there's, there, there's the proper connection to dunya. Obviously, people have to earn halal living, kasbi halal. There's you know mundane tasks of eating, drinking, going and getting the groceries so you can eat and drink, earning so you can have the money to eat and drink. Okay, Then there's Islamically worthwhile tasks such as maintaining family relations, etc. But there's another aspect of deen, which is the unnecessary, another aspect of dunya, which is the unnecessary overconnection. So every over, it's not really a word in English, but every overconnectedness to dunya will lead to being underconnected in deen. It's that simple. So there's something to do that, oh, I'm not muttaqeen, that's why I don't make up for fajr. Maybe we're not muttaqeen, that's a separate issue. Right? That's a whole separate thing. That is itself a problem. But the reason we didn't make up for Fajr was actually much more simple is that we didn't value our Iman. 
and we let ourselves get overconnected with the seen, and we're losing our connection with the unseen. Because Salah is also about the unseen. And I think this is actually one of the beauties. I mean, people only talk about one thing when they talk about the fact that all mu'min have been commanded by Allah subhanahu to face towards the Kaaba, and they say this is unity. It's unity. I mean, obviously, if you're standing in front of the Kaaba and everybody's praying, but if, if I'm praying in this corner of the world and you're praying in that corner of the world, if for me, fine, maybe it's unity that I know, but I'm not thinking about any other person at that time that I'm praying that people in different corners of the world are facing the same direction. It's actually unseen. I cannot see the Kaaba at that time. It's unseen for me. But I'm praying in its jah, in its direction. I cannot see the mercies of Allah Subhanahu descending on the Kaaba. But I'm praying in that direction. If I, even if I can see the Kaaba, making tawaf around the Kaaba, I can see the Kaaba, but I cannot see the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala, His tajilliyat descending on the Kaaba, it's unseen. Allah Ta'ala says in Quran, make sajda get qurb. You cannot see qurb. You can't see it, it's unseen. Huwa ma'akum aina ma'akuntum, unseen. Fa inni kareeb, unseen. Wa nahnu akrub ilayk min habl al unseen. This is what our day, and then you cannot spend four, six hours at night connected to something seen and think you will be able to wake up in the morning to do something that connects you to the unseen. So let me go back to this word yakin. Uh, before then, I want to also very briefly talk about some of the articles of Iman. So when we go back to this word yakin, this is really what it's about, and and, and and the reason I want to stress this is, so think of think of it like this: yakin is the absolute highest level of iman. So I want to repeat again: you and me may not have, may not ever have in our whole lifetime, the absolute highest level of taqwa, but you and me must have in our lifestyle the absolute level of iman called yakin. So these are different things. This yakin is essential. Iman is essential, critical, foundational. We must have yakin. Now these aren't two competing things again. I'm not, but I'm just saying we've talked so many times about taqwa. Yakin, yakin, yakin. Because what happens? Yakin, absolute taqwa will save you from ever doing sin, inshallah. Absolute yakin will save you from ever losing your iman, inshallah. And that's what I realized that it, it's a crisis of knowledge and education. Remember all those things I said earlier about the Muslims who are getting this weakness in their iman, weakness in hamd and overconnected to unseen and feeling they don't need the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's because nobody ever taught them yaqeen. Nobody guided them to yaqeen. They just thought that iman was just this to say the shahada. That's why I've been speaking about this for the last two times. They, they stopped way too soon. <laughs> They stopped way before yaqeen. They had what we call nafsi iman. So the ulama, they have something which is called nafsi iman. You can call it the bare minimum essential core of iman. The very atoms weight of iman itself that will ultimately, inshallah, take a person out of jahannam. But that's the bare minimum. That iman was supposed to again be nurtured, nourished, sustained. Sifat iman. Then kamal iman, yaqeen. Nobody's thinking about that. And you, you, know, you can't do that. You won't be able to survive in this world. It's not possible. That's why people are struggling. It's not their fault. You cannot walk around this world with just an atom's weight of bare minimum iman. It's not enough to survive. You end up missing salah. You end up doing haram things. You end up eating haram things, drinking haram things, seeing haram things. It's not enough. You have to have that yaqeen, yaqeen. And you know, I've also realized a lot of what shaitan does, yes, shaitan does try to get people to do sin and bad actions and remove their a'mal. But one of the major things of shaitan is he tries to take people away from their from yaqeen or keep them away from yaqeen. Subtle whispers, subtle doubts. Hmm? Allahu Akbar. Now another fitna that is also a lot on YouTube, but I can't believe, on the Sahaba. Sahaba Kiram, another line of attack to do 
derail people from the yaqeen in deen. Because remember, the entire Quran reached us through Sahaba. There's only one way you can say, if you say what I said earlier today, that I have absolute yaqeen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent wahi through Angel Jibreel to Sayyidina Rasulullah in the cave at Mount Hira, you cannot say that without Sahaba. There's no way mean you would have ever known that if it was not for Sahaba. If you say, I believe that this Mus'haf of Quran al-Kareem is Kalamullah, Kitabullah, you cannot say that without Sahaba. If you don't understand the fundamental, foundational core, maqam of Sahaba Kiram, radiallahu ta'ala anmajma'in. Not they were not prophets, so you cannot look in their lives, they're not going to be like Anbiya. They're not masoom like Anbiya Alayhi Samajmain. But what they are, they're Ahli Deen, they're Siddiqeen, they're Muttaqeen, they're Salihin. Which is another line of attack. So there's an unending line of attack. Some there have even been some people now the Billah who attacked Anbiya. This is something I learned very recently. You may be shocked to hear this, and maybe at some point I, I, I don't want to say it, I should make a more academic presentation on it, but it's, it's actually so well known in their own circles. Jews and Christians both, they're under, I was shocked to learn this in the past one year, their understanding of prophets and Biya is radically different from you and mine, from Deen of Islam's. They believe prophets can sin, they even believe there have been bad prophets, they have a completely different understanding. This is why when you tell them that, oh, we believe that Jesus is a prophet because we think that that is going to make them realize that we have given Sayyidina Isa a, a very high rank because for us, Anbiya alayhi salam, alayhi salam ajma'in, the prophets have a high rank. For them, prophets don't have such a high rank. Khair. So this is something that some, some modern Muslims have also fallen to critiquing, not just Sahaba Kiram radiallahu ta'ala anjma'in, but even critiquing Anbiya al-Mursaleen alayhi salam ajma'in. Khair. So going back to this, uh, Yaqeen, Yaqeen. So this is a dua we should make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll show you one easy and beautiful way, because it will allow me to also introduce another word to you that you have all already know. But an easy way to get Yaqeen is to be Radhi, to be pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is like one of the easiest ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it, to have Yaqeen and Iman. So remember the famous... Uh, dua, the Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu dua or you know statement that Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to say Raditu Billahi Rabba wa bil Islami Dina wa bi Muhammadin Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam Nabiyan or Rasula Raditu Billahi Rabba wa Islami Dina wa Muhammadin Nabiya alright just that I am Razi that's it that, that actually just that Expression, why? Radiyatam mardiyya, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. When you are radi, pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes pleased with you. If we simply express this with our tongue, verbally, that we are pleased and happy and radi and content, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Rabb, Islam is our deen, and Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is our prophet, Insha'Allah, the regular repetition of that, professing that on a daily basis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gift us with yaqeen. Sometimes I'm amazed. You know the hadith? Saying that the people who deny hadith, these modern and reformers who we don't believe in hadith, I don't think they realize. It's, it's not just about one or two laws. They say they don't believe in hadith because they don't like one or two of the laws, maybe more than one or two. They don't like a bunch of laws. But they don't realize that once they remove hadith, it's not just the laws they're removing. They're going to lose all these du'as, all the dhikr, all the mentions of Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam's own beauty, all of the mercies of Allah Ta'ala that Allah Ta'ala chose to reveal through the tongue of Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam in hadith so that he would become Rahmatullah Alam as a manifestation of him being Rahmatullah Alameen as opposed to mentioning those mercies by him, but indirectly in Kalamullah in Quran. It's all removed. All the sunnah du'as removed. Right? Just so that they could make some haram things halal. Just so that they could make some haram things halal, they decided to remove all the hadith from deen, from their own consideration of deen. Right? And they lost so many other things also. 
And it's a tragedy. That's why you, you will see that they barely just come for Jamaat. They don't make du'a. They don't make dhikr. They don't have any of those feelings described by Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam in hadith. Khair, so I, 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 anyway, I don't want to spend yakin. All, all of us, inshallah, should know. And I think I think I actually did once give a talk specifically on yakin. But yakin, yakin, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say this sentence, Rabbi 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 and even more, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I may have begged you for health or for, and you should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything. Make dua to Allah for everything. But sometimes also talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like this. You know, even more than I asked you for health or for job or for protection from enemies or for anything in this world, even much more than I ever, all the duas I ever made to you in my entire life for any and all of those things, you know, I ask you today even more than all of that, grant me yaqeen. Grant me yaqeen, hifazat of iman. Grant me the preservation of iman. Protect me from all, any and every fitna that may weaken, lessen, challenge, harm, or hurt my iman. Okay, now very briefly I'm going to talk about, uh, and you know there's a lot of material, alhamdulillah, on this in the Islamic literature written by the ulama, even I think many things on YouTube. Uh, you know, obviously you have to be careful about who you listen to. And also remember that, you know, there will be people who have made very good presentations on one topic. It doesn't mean that everything else they said is necessarily correct. And if you listen to their presentation on one topic, it doesn't mean that by listening to that one presentation, you are thinking or declaring to the world that everything they said is correct. But let us just look at this. Uh, so there are different ways it's come uh, in Quran al Karim and also in the Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, the Hadith of Jibreel. So sometimes this is called the Articles of Faith. All right. And if we were to do the complete list, so the complete list is very long. Uh, just to give you one example, because another hadith in Bukhari, narrated by Imam Bukhari, the Sayyidina Rasulullah said that Iman is 70-something. This is the way you could translate English. Iman is 70-something branches of faith. So many of the muhaddithin, commented on what these 70 something branches are means they went into the verses of quran al-kareem and the different hadith and they tried to pluck out uh what they felt and many of them took in terms of from arabic language something to be seven so you have this famous term the 77 branches of faith one of the better known works on this in arabic and best known in english because it was translated in english was imam al bayhaqi 77 branches of faith which we used to teach a number of times but i don't remember if i ever finished it i definitely remember teaching portions of it at different times it's, but it's a very small book that if you were to read it it's literally it may, i mean i can't say that but it's very very small 30 40 50 pages very small work okay so that is a task for all of you to do inshallah you can get that book in arabic english i think it's available in urdu also 77 branches of faith by imam al Taala, and that will mention really a lot of things and a lot of topics which i would not be able to get to today uh, but about haya being a part of iman so many things that are part of iman the basic and most fundamental things that come, uh, that come in the very start of Quran al-Karim, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, and that came in the Hadith of Jibreel in Bukhari and Muslim. Hold on. Okay, uh, so you will find, f uh, let's count them. So there are several things that are often always mentioned. Okay, number will be Malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa yawm al-akhri wa al-qadr khairihi wa sharrihi. But the first was Billahi. So six things, if you will. 
belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belief in the prophets and messengers. Sec number one, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, belief in the prophets and messengers. Number three, belief in the angels. Number three, belief in the angels. Malaika. Belief number four in Qutub, which is all the scriptures revealed revelations by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which includes Quran al Karim first and foremost. Yo al yom al akhir, the last day, the day of judgment. And number six is destiny. Well, Qadri Khairi, he was Shari, destiny, both good and bad. So six things. So obviously each and every one of these six is a major, major, you know, can be a series of lectures in of itself. And that's what I was mentioning, that you will find a lot of material on this. Very briefly, I'm just going to mention a couple of things. Okay. First and foremost, obviously, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So valuing our Iman in that sense, what does it mean? And I would just, even a rational question, that if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why in the world aren't you turning to Him? Like a non-Muslim would ask a Muslim that question. Look, I, the non-Muslim would say, I don't believe in God, so I don't do A, B, C, D. But if I really knew a God existed, I'd, be, I'd definitely be getting up at 5 a.m. to pray to Him. And if you told me, and if I believed that a God existed and in the last third of the night He would answer every single thing I said, I would be getting up in the last third of the night. So what does it mean valuing our iman if you be believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Value of the qadr of that. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to say in Quran, wa ma qadr Allah haqq qadrihi. That they did not value Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not esteem Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it was Allah ta'ala's right and His magnificence and majesty that He should be valued and esteemed. So just brief points on this. To believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means value Him. And I would say salah, dua, and istighfar. Hamd, so just look this, let's maybe maybe just today, just so that we don't say too much new uh, additional material, let's relate to something we said earlier. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiru. So three things, hamd. So pray your salah, do tasbih, hamd, say, praise Allah subhanahu in these different ways, through salah, dhikr, dua. Number two, isti'ana, seek Allah Ta'ala's help through dua and through itaa, through obedience and submission. And third, seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Make istighfar daily. Rabbi gfirli wa tubu alayya inna ka anta tawabu rahim. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal Rumatar narrates in his musnad that to say this is the Sayyidina Rasulullah, his son Allah used to make this dua a hundred times a day. Rabbi gfirli wa tubu alayya inna ka anta tawabu rahim. Right? So to value having Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. Behave, behave as if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Live a life as if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu aminu billahi. Second, belief in the prophets and messengers. So this is, I wanted to show this in a different way today, but you know, time has really run out. But it's it gives you a much deeper sense of human history. Again, unseen. So the human be average human being who is alive right now and doesn't believe in prophets... So for them, maybe they're connected to their national history. Maybe they have some patriotic history. Maybe they view, let's say, they view themselves as the West. They could go back to Plato. How far can they go back, right? But if you believe in the prophets and messengers, alayhim as ajma'in, you have a history. Because you believe in all of them. It's not just Sayyidina Rasulullah, he's sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is Nabi al-Anbiya. So it, 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 it helps us because this history is unseen. It helps us realize who we are and what is my place in this world. There are people called Anbiya who have walked this earth. Who am I? All right? I'm nothing. I'm just, I'm just another human being from countless billions who should just be walking in their footsteps and carrying on their mission. I have no other worth in this world. My only worth in this world is to whatever extent I follow the Anbiya, Alayma Samur Ajmain. And or I try to share and spread the mission of Anbiya. That's it. I have no other worth in this world. And to think about their stories and think about their struggles and think about their Iman. It's very important. You know, I think this, you know, because these, the stories of Anbiya, because their Ika stories are generally easily understood by children. So I think it's right that children are taught stories, but a mistake adult Muslims make is they think that the prophets is some childhood level thing to study about Islam. That's just wrong. <laughs> this isn't something, again, it's not something we're done with. Like, okay, we're done with Iman, we said Shada, we're done with the Anbiya because, oh, I did that in childhood in Islamic school. 
No, no, no. So to really deeply, and alhamdulillah, again, you will find a lot of material on this. No less an authority than Ibn al-Kathir, uh, Ibn al-Kathir, not al Ibn al-Kathir, Rahimullah Ta'ala, has uh, written a work which has been translated in English as well on the stories of the Prophet, alayhi wasalam, ajma'in. But just think who they were, you know, because, let me explain to you another way, that an atheist doesn't even believe human beings can reach this level. For the atheist, the highest level a human can reach is Einstein, right? There's a much higher level. We have a different understanding of humanity because we believe that there's a group in humanity called Anbiya wal Mursaleen, prophets and messengers, that they're the peak of humanity, the pinnacle of humanity. And they are the exemplars of humanity. They are the, all of them are Uswa, right? It's a different understanding of humanity because humanity, any species, is based on the most excellent members of their species, the hallmark, the models, the paragons. It's a very different understanding. Clear? So, wa uh, malaikatihi, so, and angels, right? And here again, the law of ahadith. And this is an exercise actually many of you can also do. It's not, you know, you should be able to do this research. There's so many online databases right now. And it's actually not so much material on this. And in the sense that it's not, it's not overwhelming it's not an overwhelming research project. You could find all the verses in Quran that mention the angels and all the hadith that mention the angels yourself and compile this information yourself. And it, it's an amazing thing. Whether it's the angels mentioned in Quran, Kiram and Katibin that we know are on our right shoulder and left shoulder, the how many limitless angels one says salam to when they turn their head right and left, how many angels protect a person, especially when you make certain du'as, how many angels are doing tawaf around the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how many angels pray for our forgiveness, make us stick far for us when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us, then how many angels make dua for us when we're fasting in the month of Ramadan. I mean, this is all unseen, right? Now, what it's a problem, even I actually don't like the English word angel, I just rather would much, this is one of the words I would much, much rather only use Arabic because when we say the word angel, Almost anybody, at least those of us who are born and raised in the West, you cannot, you can't stop your mind thinking of images you may have seen and whether it was books or church images, basically, of wings and these type of things. And there's mention of the wings of Jibril alayhi salam, but I think that's more metaphorical. It does not, anyway, it should not call to mind a picture or image that we have seen in books or someone may have seen on a church or something. So really, malaika. So understand them like this, nur. Focus not on the wing, focus on the word nur. They're beings of light, okay? So malaika, pure beings of immaculate light who for all of their life have never sinned because they're not capable of sinning. Fine, no problem. But the, they still, but the point is they've never sinned. So they're pure and pristine. And their entire life, Allah Ta'ala has created them for one purpose that they do His, Allah Subh'anaHu Ta'ala's tasbih and hum, they glorify Him and praise Him. But now, because Allah Ta'ala has commanded, there are many of them, thousands, millions, Allahu Alam of them, who will pray for you and me, our forgiveness. Right? So this is a, a, a very big piece of our iman. And, and this is why it's mentioned repeatedly. It's, part, it's one of the articles of iman mentioned in Quran and Hadith. Here are so many, many things about angels. Again, but the point being unseen to relate it to our theme for today. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophets and Messengers of Islam Ajma'in, Kutub, books and scriptures. Maybe I, no, I didn't do it. Angels, book, books and scriptures. So obviously our belief in Quran al Karim and also belief in early. And let's extrapolate from that I, because I'm trying to go fast now to finish up. This means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to communicate. What is wahi? What is kutub? It means it's khitab, it's communication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's bayan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shows a very beautiful thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an absent rub. He's guiding humanity, loving humanity, communicating to humanity, teaching humanity. Allah mal insana malam ya'lam. He is teaching humanity that which they did not know, could never have known. So we're not alone in this world, we're not unguided in this world. And we're not the first throughout history Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been sending. Scripture, revelation, prophets, messengers. And also a very important belief is that there's a knowledge 
the source of that knowledge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that knowledge is greater than the other knowledge whose source is human beings. So the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than philosophy, than science and everything else because the source of the knowledge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the source is greater than the source of all those, all those human all those other knowledges which are all human thinkers. Well, Yawm al-Akhir. So this is the Day of Judgment itself, but it's also representing the entire belief in life after death, resurrection, Day of Judgment, and Akhirah, and an eternal hereafter. Right? Very important thing. And this is a problem. Maybe I think it's a problem because I mean, I wasn't taught, but most people, if they were taught this in their childhood, they don't seem to take this seriously. This is a radical, radical belief that this life is temporary and there's another life that's eternal. And that whole decision on that one day called al yom Al-Akhir, the decision, the result will affect my eternity, but the decision will be based on my one mortal lifetime. Hmm? So actually, in that sense, this world is all important. Earlier, I said this world has this world itself has no worth, but the way I live my life, my lifestyle, my lifetime, my book of deeds, is all important because it's going to determine my entire akhirah. Khair, we can only hope that Allah Subhanahu wa rahmah and mercy will determine our akhirah because if any one of our akhirah is determined on our book of deeds, we're all going to jahannam. We don't need any analysis for that. And the last thing, well, qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi, and this is also, I think all of you will know, this is also something that, it, it you know, has become a fitna for people to understand properly. So, this is a very long topic. What can I very briefly say to you today is, well, fo first focus on the khair and not the shar, and that the shar is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending us evil for the sake of evil, but rather every shar has within it a path to khair. Every evil in the form of test, every evil is actually test, trial, tribulation that can be a means to attain some khair, whether in this world or in the akhirah. The second type of shar is not that which Allah SWT is sending on us in such a manner, but the shar that we, the shar that we earn through our own deeds. Bima kasabat aidikum. It means that what you earn through your own hands, hands means your own actions, your own deeds. But know there also that if we make toba, we make istighfar and toba from our own evils, then when Allah Subhanahu wa inshallah accepts that istighfar and toba and then sends his additional mercy on us, that also then can become a shar and evil that is a means to khair. All right. So ultimately, then it can be all khair. And also, it's actually a very beautiful teaching because it also makes us realize that we are powerless in this world. Because if you felt that you were powerful in this world, which is incorrect, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, but if we felt that we were powerful in this world, then we would, you know, have a responsibility that we would not be able to bear. We would not be able to bear that. Uh, this care another long discussion. Anyway, uh, so I did tell you at the start, there would be too much material. You can look at this later, let this sink in. But the very important uh, lesson for me and for you and for all of us today is what I've tried to capture in the title also, to value our Iman. That the, our Iman is what it's all about and nobody can take your Iman away from you. Don't think like that. Obviously, there are people and forces and ideologies, but ultimately your iman is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you, mukhlisin al if you only and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, strive to preserve your iman, nurture your iman, safeguard your iman, and you make protecting and developing your iman between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah, inshallah, we will be raised as mu'mineen on that day of judgment. And that's the most important thing. Because it's not only the mutakin that will go to Jannah. 
all mu'mineen will go to Jannah, inshallah, by the Rahman mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make each and every one of us from Allah dhina amanu, from the mu'mineen, from the muttaqeen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant each and every one of us a life where we deeply, ardently, devotedly, devoutly, lovingly do the hamd and praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala teach us and guide us to every way of doing his hamd and protect us from ever falling into any type of ingratitude towards Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide each and every one of us to make isti'ana, to feel our need for Him, dependence on Him, our yearning for Him, searching for Him, seeking help from Him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in our heart and increase in our heart every feeling of remorse, regret, and shame, and guilt over any error, mistake, sin, foulness, evil that we did. And may we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness for that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and purify us from that as he is al ghafur and al ghafar ar rahman ar rahim and at tawab al kareem and we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us firm and steadfast on Iman, that He keep us always from Allah Dina Amanu, stronger and stronger from the Mu'mineen, give us higher and higher and intense levels of taqwa, so we become from the Muttaqeen, Siddiqeen, Salihin, Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us yakeen in our Iman, Yaqeen in Qur'an, Yaqeen in Him, Yaqeen in all of His books and scriptures, Yaqeen in all of the angels, Yaqeen in all of the prophets and messengers, Yaqeen in the destiny, Yaqeen in the last day, in the Akhirah, and Yaqeen in the destiny, the good in it and the bad in it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept are being radhi with him and may Allah Ta'ala from his tawfiq keep us always and ever radhi with him as our Rabb, with Islam as our deen and with Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as our Nabi and Rasul, as our Prophet and Messenger Khatam and Nabiyeen and may Allah Ta'ala give all of us the tawfiq to be true to our words true to our knowledge, to learn more about deen, practice more in deen, feel more in deen, and to live a life upon deen. Wa akhirat da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen, ameen, ya rabbil alameen.